What's up everyone, welcome back. Patrick here, moving on to the next example, still dealing with the financial modeling chapter. Now, a couple things I wanna mention. This example here, it's very similar to the example we did before on the website, the video before. And if you didn't watch that example first, I highly recommend doing so before watching this one because the previous one is a little bit more simple and I do a lot of fundamental explanations on how we go about this. And as I mentioned in that video, what can sometimes be different is if we're told that there's certain items on the income statement that are staying constant. And if you read it carefully, notice that we're told the interest expense and tax rate is staying constant. And so forecasting that net income, which is what we're gonna do in part A, is gonna take a little bit more work than the previous example. So I do recommend watching the previous example. There's gonna be a lot of carryover from that one to this one. So I may go through certain parts here a little quicker. So make sure you watch that one first. Second thing I wanna mention, as I do with all these examples, is that all of this is written out in the PDF file at the beginning of the section on the website. So you could print that out. You don't have to write all of this out. And if you're watching this on YouTube, there's a link in the description box to the course website where you can find that PDF. So a company's recent financial statements are given below. We have the income statement, the balance sheet, all these figures here, they are in millions. So this 35.6, for example, that would be 35,600,000. We're gonna keep it as these decimal values though. Um, the sales are gonna grow at 12%, these sales here. And then we're told the interest expense and tax rate is staying constant. And we have these three questions. So part A, using the percentage of sales method, we have to forecast next year's net income. Part B, if the payout ratio is 60%, we have to find the new or external financing that's gonna be needed. And then part C, if the new financing is restricted to 14 and a half million, that's the most of new financing that the company can take, how will that dividend policy have to change? How will that payout ratio have to change? right there. So first thing we're going to do is, as we did in the previous example, is let's find out what that forecasted sales is going to be, because that's pretty much what a lot of these items on these financial statements is going to be based on. So what we would do to get the forecasted sales is we would find or we would take the current sales, 205.6, and multiply it by one plus that growth rate of 0.12 of 12%, you wanna convert that to decimals. And when you do that calculation here, you'd end up getting 230 and 27 cents. So I'm gonna round all of these numbers to two decimal places. Now, what they're asking in part A is to find what the forecasted net income is going to be. And in the previous example, what we did was we just found the percentage of net income of sales. So we just took 6.9 divided by 205.6, then multiplied by that forecasted sales to get the net income. But because we're told this interest here is going to stay constant, we can't do that. Everything else all the other expenses like cost of goods sold, depreciation, those are gonna change in proportion to sales. So they're also gonna grow at 12%, but then this interest is gonna stay constant. So that means that we're gonna to have to manually calculate everything in this area of the income statement. But what's nice is we don't have to find all of the forecasted amounts here Really, all we have to do is find the forecasted EBIT using the percentage of sales because everything else is growing in the sales. We already know it's growing, but the cost of goods sold is going to grow in proportion to sales. That means the gross profit is going to grow in proportion to sales. That means the depreciation is going to grow in proportion to sales, which means the earnings before interest and taxes is going to grow in proportion to sales. So what we can do to sort of save time is we can find the forecasted earnings before interest and taxes using the percentage of sales. So we would take the 18 
18.00 divided by the 205.6. Now this is gonna be some decimal number. It's gonna be about 8.75%, but I actually wouldn't round it. So in your calculator, just leave that amount. That's gonna be there. And then multiply it by the 230, the forecasted sales. So the exact same process that we did in the previous video in the previous example. And then over here, what we're gonna end up getting is $20.16. So basically we have the earnings before interest and taxes. This is gonna be the forecast amount. It's the $20.16. Now, you may get a question where they're asking for the forecasted cost of goods sold or the forecasted depreciation, for example. And that would be easy because you would just do the exact same thing as a previous example this divided by that get that percentage multiply it by that forecasted sales or if they were asking for the forecasted depreciation this divided by that multiply it by the forecasted sales but in this case they're only asking for the forecast and net income so even though we still have to do some work here we don't have to find out all these amounts we can just go straight to the earnings before interest and taxes and find out that forecasted amount but then after that everything has to be manually done so what we would do at this point is we would subtract that interest, $6.50. So that would be here. And then what's gonna happen is we're gonna end up having the earnings before taxes. And when you subtract these amounts here, what you would get is 13.66. Now here, what we have to do is manually calculate the tax. We're told the tax rate is staying constant as well. So we're gonna to have to find out how much tax are we gonna pay on this. And so the way we do that, we can't just, again, anything below the interest, we can't just grow it at that 12%, right? Everything has to be manually done. So first thing we have to do is find out what the tax rate is. And we can find that out from the income statement here. And the way we do that is we just take the amount of tax we paid divided by the earnings before taxes, right? So the tax rate, it's a separate calculation here, it's 4.6 over 11.5. Uh, sometimes the tax rate will be given, sometimes you're gonna have to manually calculate it like this, and you would get 0 0.4 over here, or 40%. So that's what the tax rate is. Then you take that tax rate and now you apply it on this earnings before taxes, because this earnings before taxes is different than this one. So 40% of this, 0 0.4 times this, would give you 5.46 if you round to two decimal places. So that's what the tax is gonna be. And now you can subtract these amounts, that's an expense, and we end up getting that net income. And the net income, is eight dollars and twenty cents right so that's the answer to part a so again a little bit more work because that interest was staying constant so we were only able to grow up to the earnings before interest and taxes at that 12 percent then everything else had to be done manually to get that forecasted netting. Now moving on to part B, what they're asking for is if the payout ratio is 60%, so from this forecast and net income, 60% of that's going to be paid out as a dividend, which means 40% is going to be retained. So given that payout ratio, what would be the new or external financing that's going to be needed? And so actually at this point, the process is going to be exactly the same as it was in the previous example. The only biggest difference between this example and the other one was finding that forecast and net income but from here everything else is going to be the same so as we did in the previous example the long-term debt we're going to keep constant that's not going to change it should be stated in the question otherwise like all balance sheet items are changing in proportion to sales but if that's not stated, then usually this is gonna stay constant. As I mentioned in the previous example though, you may wanna follow up with your prof about that. But most textbooks, most profs are gonna keep that long-term debt constant. So that's not gonna change. The shareholder's equity, we can't just grow it as a percentage of sales. We're gonna to have to manually calculate that. It's gonna be that beginning equity, that current equity, which is 35.3 in this case, 
plus that addition to retain earnings, which we're going to get from this forecast and net income. But all of the other balance sheet items, so all of these items here on the left side and then the current liabilities, they're going to grow in proportion to sales. They're going to grow at that 12% as well. So to find out, for example, the forecasted cash, we would take that current cash, 35.6, and divide it by the current sales, which I erased over here to give myself some room, but it's basically 205.6. So finding out what's the percentage of cash to sales from the current financial statements, and then we're gonna take this amount and multiply it by that forecasted sales to give us that forecasted cash amount. And when you do that calculation, you'd end up getting 39.87 for the forecasted cash. And again, another way you could check these calculations, you could take this, multiply it by 1.12, grow it at 12%, should get that same value. And then I did it for the other balance sheet items for the accounts receivable, took this amount, divided it by that current sales, multiplied by the forecasted sales, inventory, long-term assets, current liability. So all these amounts circled here are those forecasted balance sheet items. And if I take these balance sheet items, put them in the actual balance sheet here, so notice this entire left side has changed and we totaled the assets using these amounts. And then the current liabilities, the 41.22, we put over here. And then the long-term debt, it's staying constant. So all that's left to figure out is that shareholders equity right there. And to do that, what we're gonna have to do is use that forecasted net income. So we're told that 60% of this is being paid out. And then we're told that, or we're not told, but that implies that 40% is being retained. Right, so 60%, 0.6 times 8.2 would give you 4.92. And then 0.4 times 8.2, 40% of 8.2 would give you 3.28. So that's the amount that is retained and that's actually the amount that we need because if you remember the forecasted equity or shareholders equity is going to be what? The current equity, which I erased, but it's 35.3 plus the addition to retain earnings. So it's going to be 35.3 plus 3.28, which is going to give us what? 38.58. So that's what the forecasted shareholders equity is gonna be. And so we take this amount and put it over here. So this is gonna be 38.58, like that. And then what would happen is you would add up this right side over here to get the total liabilities and equity. And when you sum of those up, you would get 196.2 on the right side of that balance sheet. And if you notice, left side, right side, they aren't balancing. And so that's where the um, external financing actually, you know what, ah, it's okay. I'll just put uh, 3.28. That's what was retained because we still have that part C and I was actually going to mention these values in part C. But um, the external financing needed, or the new financing needed, whichever terminology your prof is using, it's always gonna be what? The forecasted assets, 211.12, minus the forecasted liabilities and equity, 196.2. Always in this order, the assets minus the liabilities and equity. And so this would end up giving us 14.92 million. So that's what the external financing needed 
is going to be because notice that the right side, the financing, is less than the forecasted assets. So what that means is that basically internally with that retained earnings, the company didn't generate enough to support this growth in assets. So externally, they're going to have to go get whether more equity or more debt to finance this. And the amount they're going to have to go get is $14.92 million in order to make that left side and right side balance out. So that's the answer to part B. Now, part C, what they're saying is, what if the company says our limit to go get external financing, the amount that we can get is 14 and a half million. So that's the maximum amount. How is, what's gonna have to change? Well, what's gonna have to change is the dividend policy. The payout ratio is gonna have to change because with this payout ratio here, with this amount that's retained, the amount of external financing needed is 14.92. But if, we're limit, uh, if the limit is 14.5, that means that the company needs to decrease this amount by 0 0.42, right? 14.92 minus 0.42 would give us 14.5. So where's this decrease gonna come from? Well, what's going to happen is we're going to have to retain that much more of the net income, which means what? Because this is, we can't just increase this. This is staying constant. So if we're retaining more, it means we have to pay out less, that much less. So the payout ratio is going to go down. The amount that we're going to pay out is going to go down and it's actually going to be 4.5 right and then over here this is going to end up being 3.7 instead and so what's simultaneously happening here is that there's 0.42 million or 420,000 being paid less in dividends which means that there's 420,000 more being retained within the company. So the total amount retained is going to be 3.7, which is going to change that. Um, it's going to change that forecast of shareholders equity. This now is going to go up by 0.42, which is going to be 39. And then when you total these amount, this is going to be different. And then when you take the difference between these, it's going to be that 14 and a half million. And they can ask pretty much anything about this. They could say, what would be the new payout ratio, for example? You would just take this and divide it by that. This could be maybe like a multiple choice question. Or what would be the new retention ratio? Take this, divide it by that. Or they may ask, not the actual percentage, they may ask for this dollar amount or this dollar amount or how much it changed by, right? Which would be the 0.42. So they could ask a lot of questions from this type of scenario. But just in general, what's happening with Part C, if we're limiting the external financing to 14.5 million, that means that 0.42 million or 420,000 more is going to have to be retained in the company, which means simultaneously the amount of dividends that are being paid has to go down by that amount as well. So the payout ratio is going down and then the retention ratio is going up.